those of you who joined us for the last panel, we focused a little more on some of the established companies and ventures and sports that are out there. And now we're going to turn our attention for a few minutes to some of the emerging sports. Um, I want to introduce first our panelist, uh, Remy Guyton, right? Is Vice President of Digital Content at Nitro Circus, the number one action sports brand for millennials and Gen Z. Leads the development of content and programming that drives over one billion, billion with a B, right? Views every year. Has also worked for Demand Media, YouTube, HBO, and Village Roadshow Pictures. Um, Ari Evans is founder and CEO of Maestro, which enables live streamers to own, engage, and monetize their audiences. He led Maestro's team to victory at the 2017 Manat Digital Esports Startup Launchpad. He's also worked at Zynga and Goldman Sachs. Brett Casadonte to my left, president and co-founder of Globestream Media, a live streaming and live event production company. He has worked with such clients as GoPro, uh, Intuit, USA Softball, and Audi to deliver live streaming. He got his start in streaming when he worked at the NASA Ames Research Center and used QuickTime to live stream research talks. And on the far end, Cody Warren is Managing Director of Communications for USA Softball. She's a former student athlete with experience in branding, digital media, public relations, and she's proud to say you can find her at the ball field ready to tweet at a moment's notice. So welcome to everybody. And I wanted, for those of you who weren't here for the last half hour, um, this is not a college lecture hall, so it's a participatory discussion. I'll ask some questions, but whenever you have a question, please raise your hand and jump on into the discussion. Um, I want to start this way, and we'll just go around the panel. Um, it's certainly one thing for the NBA or Major League Baseball to find an audience through streaming. The name recognition is already there. The fan base is already there. And in the case of Major League Baseball, they even built their own streaming infrastructure that was so successful that the Walt Disney Company bought it. Um, if you don't have that kind of built-in name recognition and that built-in fan base, how do you try to find your audience in a world where there's a million choices? You can go ahead. Uh, I, I, you know, for smaller sports, I think that's, of course, the $10,000 question. Um, the digital tools that are available today help offset some of that, uh, being skilled in Google search and uh, online advertising uh, through digital platforms, Bing, et cetera. Uh, you kind of have to be in those places. And of course, social media is critically important. Uh, another important aspect of that is if you're able to identify influencers who have an interest in the type of sport that you may be covering, and trying to engage them, reach out to them, and facilitate a way to bring their audiences into uh, the sports that you may be covering. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that as well. I'd say with us, we found success um, really in the social media space because we have a lot of different platforms, a lot of different audience coming in through the platform, and a lot of people who are super enthusiastic but may not be um, part of the sport, but they want to share content from the sport and so engage their audience. Like, and we found that when we have events, even inviting them to, even if we don't have a big influencer budget, inviting them, giving them a special experience so they can create content that gets to their audience, that is not something that we could always afford to pay for. But then also leaning into a lot of our athletes and writers, they're digital natives, they're influencers in and of themselves. So really making sure they have the tools and have access to do everything they need to create content for their own channels as well. So we have a different take on this. <clears throat> There's actually two ways to grow an audience, right? The first one is you bring in new viewers. The other way is that you retain existing viewers. And I think the retention angle hasn't really been explored very much. People don't understand necessarily why audiences are watching their content, what makes someone spend more time watching my content, what makes them come back more regularly. So that's a particular angle that we're trying to explore with our customers and try to use interactivity as a way to create a new data set that you can then kind of correlate to those KPIs. Like if someone chatted, do they watch longer? A lot of the panelists are talking about these forms of interactivity that do drive those metrics. We're seeing the same thing. I think the strongest form of marketing today is still word of mouth, right? So you want to give someone such a great experience that they're going to tell someone else about it. That's the strongest way to bring anyone in. 
So what are the ways that you can create a really strong experience? It's not just maybe content delivery, but it's everything else that's revolving around it. Those are some of the topics that we're looking at. Yeah, I know for us, um, we are, we're in a unique situation because we are an NGB and we are just a singular sport that we do deliver to our audience. And traditional sports are suffering a little bit from a participation standpoint. So uh, at USA Softball, we just really try to make strategic partnerships with folks who do have a larger platform. So MLB, for example, and really just getting a bat and ball in someone's hand and then showing how fun this sport can be uh, to potential new participants and even the, one who are, the ones who are going to our camps, our clinics, things like that. Um, and then I know somebody mentioned it earlier on the panel, but personalities. We're a sport that's driven on the personality of our athletes. And so um, using our athletes and using social media, TV, anything that we can just to promote uh, them as an athlete, but also just the fun side of the sport. So that way people who maybe have never picked up a bat and a ball can see just how much fun that they're having and then maybe want to give it a go. How do you convince the people who are participating in the sports and events that you're presenting that that sort of personality public relations thing is, is part of what they need to do? Some people, I imagine, take to it really naturally. They're outgoing. And others are like, I just want to play the game. I don't really have any interest in this. How do you get them to, uh, to ultimately work for the benefit of what everybody's working for? I think once they understand and see people who do have the personalities and are embracing social media, the opportunities that come to them, um, they kind of quickly get on board the social media and the digital train. Um, so it really just kind of takes that one superstar on the team to kind of trickle down to the rest of them. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously, we have 18 on our roster. Not all 18 are going to be the best at um, you know, speaking in front of people or just engaging on social media. So it's just educating them on what the platforms can do for them, um, both from a branding standpoint and a financial standpoint. Yeah, I'd echo that same thing. Like we have athletes who are very engaged with shit, like athletes who've started their own YouTube channels who have gathered over a million subscribers on their own and athlete and they see the opportunities that come to that athlete because of that like whether it's sponsors and all these other things but there is also the education and the opportunity for people who maybe aren't as well versed who just need to find their voice and find their platform because maybe like YouTube isn't the thing because it's it's a lot to edit a video every week and they're like I don't have that time but maybe I'm really good at Instagram live with a video on Instagram like giving them the education so they understand kind of how they can find their voice on these channels is really important. The audiences for a lot of the sports and events that we're discussing in this panel uh, tends to be younger than perhaps if you're looking at basketball or football or baseball whether you want to call it Gen Z or apparently now there's younger than Gen, Gen, Gen A, Alpha. That's Alpha. Um, beta, I imagine, will soon follow. Um, the strategies that are used to reach viewers for more traditional sports, can you adapt any of those to the events that you're producing, or do you have special ways that you can share that are designed to help attract younger viewers? So um, our company kind of started off in the eSports space, where we work with big companies like Epic and Activision Blizzard and Ubisoft, some of those. We see the trend mostly happening in the sort of opposite direction, where the traditional sports are looking to the esports and what they're doing well to incorporate into their leagues. But there is a little bit of the other thing happening, where you know esports is trying to validate itself, although it doesn't really need to because the numbers speak for themselves, I think. But they are trying to make themselves more professional. For example, looking at what Overwatch League has done is the first esports league to have a regional team structure. Right, so previous esports teams weren't really geolocated, and now they are. So we'll kind of see. I think we're the jury's still out on whether or not that's actually the right move for the space. But we are seeing, you know, esports. I mean, even look at the way that they cast these games. It's video games, but they're wearing suits. The casters, they're trying to legitimize the look and feel of it to be more like sports, and maybe appeal to sports watchers to come and check this thing out. We'd uh, talked a little bit in the previous panel, but I want to hit it a little more here on the subject of interactivity. How can you make what you provide interactive so that the people who are watching it can participate, and how critical is that in retention? I think adding interactivity really is kind of uh, 
the next generation of a lot of video and en en entertainment. Uh, things like uh, something as basic as having fantasy leagues. I mean, fantasy leagues are out there. They haven't necessarily been tied uh, a lot yet closely to a broadcast, um, but having more of that kind of real-time interaction uh, where you can pick teams. Um, during a, an event, you get a lot of statistical integration into that. Uh, ultimately, it's all to enhance the overall storytelling of the event, right? Uh, as we've heard from the previous panel and here as well, it's a lot about personalities and individuals and really helping to um, get the information out about them. They're the ones who, uh, who draw people in. And having, having the ability to see the statistics, uh, you know, compete with friends maybe through a head-to-head -head pick them and um, fantasy sports type interaction, I think is a, a good stepping stone and a nice starting point to add more acti uh, interactivity to, particularly for sports that aren't like the big headlining sports that have huge budgets that can invest in online retailing and all those types of things. What are the more cost effective things for uh, smaller engagements? So our viewpoint on this is that interactivity is becoming table stakes. Like soon you will rarely watch content where you're not engaged somehow with it. And I think if when we talk to our customers, we ask them, you know, do you want to be interactive? The answer is always yes, of course, that sounds great. But what does it practically mean to be interactive? Right? How should I interact with my audience? And the framework that we've given them to think through this is actually really simple. It's what are the key moments that are occurring in your content? And what do you want the audience to do at those key moments? So we have like a an interactive overlay system that can be triggered by something like a like a line producer type role. And it's all about getting the audience to do something at these moments, whether it's share a highlight clip of something that just happened, whether it's you know check your fantasy scores, place a bet, uh, chat with people, buy something. You know, that's kind of like those downstream metrics that really matter to a business beyond views. Like what is the real impact to your business? It's gonna be revenue, time spent, right? So that we try to really create almost like the square spaceification of making it easy. Like some of the things that you just described are quite hard. That's why they're not done today, right? What if a broadcaster could install fantasy sports into their broadcast with one click? What if a broadcaster could install betting into their live stream with one click, right? The app store for video, it's coming. We're trying to be the ones to create that. Um, I'd add that we, just in a smaller test, we had a live stream deal with Facebook where around some competitions. And Facebook at the time was very interested in interactivity and connectivity. And you did see metrics around watch times getting longer the more you were interacting with people. Just even, you know, people always want to share their knowledge about their athletes or kind of have an impact on the content that they're watching. So even when people were commenting, we had athletes who were from Australia but competing in Paris and their family were logged on like way early in the morning, like telling them hi, and then the announcer would say that. So people could see the kind of feedback loop. So it just kind of kept going and going and kind of getting more people engaged and getting more people to comment and getting people to watch longer. So it was really helpful. A lot of learnings came out of that, a lot of tools we hope the platforms have in the future, but it was a fun sort of test to around engaging people specifically. In our previous panel this morning, we had folks from, among other places, Fox Sports, Comcast, giant companies where if you go into the boss and say, I have this really great idea, not going to pay off right away, but we're going to try it because it's super creative. And you might get a few years to figure out how to monetize that. And I'm wondering, uh, on a smaller scale, or maybe you don't have that kind of runway, how do you balance the tension between wanting to do neat, fun, crazy things, and yeah, I'm not sure how long I have before this pays off. So one of the potential issues, I think, with interactivity is that people want to try really crazy things just to be crazy, but there's no real business benefit that can be measured. That's why everything that we try to do is really tied to watch time, retention, and spend, because those very clearly impact your business. So for example, when we went to talk to the NFL, you know, the idea was, hey, we're gonna double the watch time of your audience on average. 
And they said, okay, well, we know how much more ad revenue we can make from that because that's a pretty easy calculation. So here's how much we'll pay you for that. And we said, okay. Right? So if you do have the metrics and if the industry starts to centralize around the metrics that do matter, then other companies can come to the table and we can all start to align around those things. Yeah, we're in a... We're in such a unique situation for us. We're more so, um, we're a membership-based organization, so we don't really use, or we haven't traditionally used live streaming or broadcast um, from a just pure advertiser standpoint to bring money in that way. Um, our focus and our goal has more so been um, getting new members to join our organization. Um, so it's really, I mean, we do you know, measure the metrics and, and all of those good things, but for us, like, it does have to be a long-term investment just because um, we are so unique in that it, it's the membership that we're more so focusing on to bring us more revenue. So for us, it's just showing the membership trends and showing how um, years where we are doing a lot of, whether it's television coverage or streaming coverage, whatever it is, um, how that directly relates to what our membership is doing. Um, but that's also increasing the content that you are putting out there. So it's easy to go out to a ballpark and put a cell phone up on a backstop and do a Facebook Live. Um, but are you really generating any more views other than the mom, the grandma, somebody who's not there at the ballpark like watching them? Or are you making it to where maybe somebody who's never played the sport uh, is seeing that and wanting to play? So it's not really great quality. So it's upping the quality that we're giving to them um, to hopefully generate more membership towards us. I have a quick question for the audience. Does anyone know how uh, most Chinese live streams monetize? It's virtual gifting. So you're watching the stream, and you're buying the streamer a digital rose, or a digital glove, or something else like that. It is by far the most revenue that's being made on live streaming platforms, specifically in China and in other Asian countries. So one thing that's going to have to change, and I think that will change, I mean, media rights the money that's being paid for them probably can't sustain at the levels that they're at right now. Uh, it's been amazing. Viewership's going down and media rates are going up. I just don't see that staying that way for a long time. So I think that many leagues are going to start looking at direct monetization, new direct monetization mechanisms that might range from some of the obvious ones like letting you buy something on the stream and tying in their merchandise business to the broadcast or trying some of these alternative ways to monetize the audience. Uh, Remy, I was going to ask you about action sports in particular. Yeah. Um, just from the name, it sounds like there's a lot of cool things you can do visually that maybe you can't do in other sports or, or maybe in esports. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you guys have been able to do to expose the action sports industry and, and maybe a little bit of the numbers because I don't know if people realize how popular it really is. Yeah, action sports, People think of it in terms of legacy, like X Games has been around for a while, but they don't realize like it's the number four sport on Instagram. So when you have things like their legacy, like soccer, soccer's number one, you know, and like action sports as a category is number four, and they'll they'll say that publicly. It's a huge area, but there's also many opportunities to kind of engage new audience. One of the things that we found, particularly working with Snap, was there's a whole, like, that 13 to 17-year-old range that is really super engaged with action sports content. We were expecting things like scooters because I don't know how many, many of you are familiar with the fact that scooters is now an action sport. Like, we have guys who are doing the most extreme things on scooters. In fact, one of our guys who started out as, they called him a scooter kid, he's now, like, 23, um, he just won X Games for the second year in a row as a BMXer, just because he's that talented and that good. And he has, he's the one who I was mentioned has his own YouTube channel. He grew an audience organically over time. Um, and the kids have come up with him. And so being in Snap, a place where um, obviously like kids are engaged on YouTube, kids are engaged on Snap, you see the opportunity for audience there. And you see that um, things that were unexpected were we knew Scooter was going to do well, BMX was going to do well, because historically those are things that younger kids are already kind of working with. What we didn't expect was we launched uh, a show around, we called them Nitro Machines, so people showing their dirt bikes, showing stuff. 
all of a sudden it's part of a feedback loop where they're submitting to us, it just took off. Like we didn't know that there was this young core, like also FMX audience out there that was like hungry for content about themselves. Because usually you think of that as kind of an older sport, especially we work with Travis Pastrana, who has been the leader in stunts and action for so long that you kind of think of it as a little above them. So there's just huge opportunity. And then we also launched um, a sport competition brand called Nitro World Games. And in that, again, we kind of looked at where can we develop new audience. And action, like action sports, traditional action sports did poo-poo scooter at first. So initially we had a broadcast deal for Nitro World Games. I think the first year I came on like three or four years ago. But what we did was we just like, hey, we're gonna broadcast the scooter events on Facebook Live. Those did extremely well. The audience was extremely engaged. The next year with our Facebook streaming deal, we ran that on Facebook because the audience had been so engaged and was there and we learned something from just doing it on our own and that, that kind of drove a whole new business, so. Are these the same scooters that will kill me walking down <laughs> the street or are they somehow? No, they don't the electric scooters. These are like human powered, but the electric scooters, yeah, they have particular rules around like don't jump these scooters, the electric ones, because they'll break. Okay. I know we're coming close to the end of the session. Any questions from the audience before I keep talking? Yeah, I would definitely say the majority of our audience is watching because they either have played, they have kids who are playing, so that's kind of the easy fish to, to really get. Um, yeah, it's, it's just, you're not going to explain the rules of softball every single time you stream or you do broadcast something, maybe like a quick like five second you know, blurb about differences in the game, that kind of thing. Um, I think that's where we, as an organization, really excel, is that you just get their initial interest peaked, and then we'll use targeted ads, whether it's on the streaming or if it's on just the broadcast of, hey, you just liked what you saw, check out usasoftball.com, and we'll explain everything you need to know, basically, about the sport for those of you who haven't played, because me as a viewer, if I'm watching, and I, every single time that I'm watching an NCAA softball game, they explain to me the rules of the game, like I'm going to get irritated, and I'm not going to want to watch that part of it. Um, but that's where we, you know, strategically pull them off-site, um, you know, during the broadcast, just to kind of do a better job of explaining it for maybe those who have never really played it before. I don't know if that answered your question. but okay. so one, of the th one of the things, uh, t to that point, so... One of the grand tragedies of live streaming is that it's just a TV broadcast that's on the internet, right? That really dulls the power of the internet. It's not a one-way broadcast medium. You can know who's on the other end of the line, right? And you could personalize the experience to those viewers. So, for example, something we're working on, I mean, this is a big problem in esports especially. Like, if you try to bring, you know, if you're a kid and you bring your dad to watch this game, they're going to have no idea what's going on most of the time. Um, so if you're watching online, if it's your first time watching this sport, you can change kind of like the graphical package and the overlays that come up. It might not be produced in the content itself with a caster, but you can add through the layers of content that appear around it. You can personalize it to the viewer. So you could be overly explanatory to a first time watcher and to someone who you know is looking at the stats, who's participating in fantasy. You drop all that stuff out and you show like a deeper, more statistics related broadcast to them. And all of this can just be automated with AI. Um, just one last thing, and I, I don't mean to end on a down note, but all the content that everybody's providing is awesome and wonderful so long as you can see it. Um, there was a team this year in Major League Soccer that decided they were going to go 100% live streaming, and then the deal didn't work out very well. The fans couldn't see it. They 
were rather rebellious about it, which I guess is good because they were interested, but it left some unhappy customers. I wonder if whoever on the panel uh, would like could speak to the reliability of streaming, both now and in the future, but also when you find out that maybe there's some sort of glitch, how your, your fans and your customers react to that and how you keep them to assure them that this is not going to happen again. Well, I think we're, we're in a world today where major broadcasters spent hundreds of millions of dollars in infrastructure to make sure that their signal goes, doesn't go down. Whereas a streamer, you know, maybe there's a few thousand dollars of infrastructure, or you've got a couple thousand dollar, couple thousand dollar encoders. So a couple things that we look at, we look at the service providers that we're using, somebody like an Akamai or a Wowza that sits on top of Akamai, uh, to ensure that our service providers are the highest quality with the broadest distribution that you can get. Um, another critical component, in my view, is to uh, have multiple encoding paths. Uh, so maybe you have an Ethernet connection at your location or two Ethernet connections. Are they going over the same network ultimately? Are they both going over AT&T or is one going over AT&T and one going over L L3 to your back-end infrastructure? Uh, these are the types of engineering things, depending on the size of your event, that <clears throat> you need to look at in order to deliver the highest reliability. And then, of course, looking at your service providers, if latency is critical, uh, your service provider, do they provide a low latency streaming option? If not, is it critical for, for your audience? Um, but the reality today is that uh, there can still be hiccups. Uh, we can't control the last mile of, of delivery all the time. Uh, and we do the best that we can within the, uh, the environment that we have. And considering the cost, it's awful darn good. Yeah, I mean, for us, um, any stream that we do, it, we don't charge a fee. But just because we don't charge a fee for the live streaming doesn't mean that if it goes down, you're like, oh, that's OK. We're not charging anything. So it doesn't really matter if the stream's up right now or not. Um, but it is aligning with partners who do all of that on the back end because like, I am not the most IT oriented mindset. That's why we bring in people like him who do all of that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's re being proactive instead of reactive. So it's planning ahead and making sure that issues that you historically know will possibly pop up. I know for us, we're an outdoor sport, so the heat is a big concern of ours. So how do you get the equipment that's going to handle the heat when you're out at the ballpark or dust and dirt? Um, so it's taking things that have historically caused that either stream to go down, broadcast to go down, and addressing that going forward so that way you know and your partners know um, what to kind of expect and what to kind of plan for. But yeah, mistakes are mistakes and disruptions are going to happen. Um, it's just doing your best to kind of know your realm and know what you can expect so that way when it does happen, you're prepared for it. Yeah, I think the good news is that these problems are getting solved. Like especially in the last five years, there's been just tremendous advancements in the engineering decisions that are being made. And now it's not just available to the biggest, you know, leagues and broadcasters in the world, but it's starting to open up and be more cost effective down the line. I think over the next few years, most of that part will become commoditized um, to a large extent. So that way, you know, you'll automatically have like a multi-cloud CDN setup. You'll automatically have these multiple encoding paths. You'll automatically have all this, all these benefits, redundancy, backups, all this stuff just built in. And you as a non-technical buyer will have great confidence and I mean that's that's coming it's, it's around the corner all right well it's uh coming up on lunchtime here and if the choice is lunch or listening to me clearly lunch is the winner so I hope you'll join me in a round of applause for our panel and thank you for coming <laughs>